Hi, John Maxwell here. I'm glad you're with me on Minute with Maxwell. For the last several lessons, we've been talking about problem-solving principles. In fact, I'm going to give you number seven right now because this one's huge. If you really want to start doing good things with the problems that you and I have, believe there is always an opportunity that every problem that comes to you has an opportunity. I, I've talked in the past about believe there's always an answer, uh, I believe there's always a lesson, but this one even goes beyond that. There's a lesson for me. There's a way to find out what the problem really is. This even goes, there's, there's an opportunity here because I have a problem. Now I could, oh my goodness, I, I wouldn't need a, a minute with Maxwell. I need a month with Maxwell to talk to you about all the opportunities I've found in problems. Can't give them all to you. Let me just give you one. Several years ago, I was in a racquetball tournament, and I just dove for a ball, and, and I pulled the lower right side of my back so badly that for three days, I, I, I literally could not get out of bed. It was a bad, bad pull. The challenge that I had, the problem that I had was that two days after that three-day period of being bed fast, I had to be in Allentown, Pennsylvania to do a leadership conference. And it was not only a leadership conference, but back then I did two-day leadership conferences and I did them eight hours a day. That's when I was young, full of energy and foolish. Okay. Now I got a problem. The problem is I know I can't stand that long for those two days and lecture. In fact, I was so bad, Margaret had to go with me because I, I couldn't even dress myself. I mean, I, I, it was, that pool was still having a lot of effect on me. And so I, I, I let them know that I would be there. I let them know what had happened. And I said, the only way I think I can do this is if you'll have like a bar stool for me to sit on. I, I need something comfortable. I'm going to have to sit for those two days. I'm going to have to teach. I'm going to have to lecture. And so that's exactly what I did. They had the bar stool, had my little table there. And I taught for two days, and I'm going back to the airport, and I'm physically feeling quite strong, and I'm very surprised. And I look at Margaret, I said, you know, wow, I'm just feeling pretty good. I mean, I've just done two days of teaching, and I've never felt this strong after two days, and I am fooled because I had this bad back, and then all of a sudden it hit me. I sat in a chair. And I've been sitting in a chair ever since. Because when I sat in a chair, I found out that I was conversational instead of directional. Instead of talking top down, I talked across the room in a conversation. And it changed the way I communicated, and it took my level of effectiveness just up through the sky. Now, never would I have discovered that on my own. In fact, after I did it, I still couldn't figure it out for a moment. But it was the problem that got me to sit in a bar stool that got me to the level of communication I am today. Now, that's one out of a hundred examples I could give you, but you've got them yourself, so I don't need to give you any more, but here's what I want you to know. If you look at the problem correctly, there's always an answer, there's always a lesson, and there's always an opportunity. The Apostle Paul said something that really was the callous for me giving in the title of my first book I ever wrote, Think on These Things. Here's what he said. Summing it all up, friends, I'll say that you'll be best if you fill your minds and meditate on things that are true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. In other words, he said, you're really going to be at your best if you meditate on good stuff. And then he begins to contrast good stuff with bad stuff. He said, the best, think on those things, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Now, the apostle Paul says, we have a choice. And in a crisis, I could either think about all the things to curse, and there's a whole bunch of cursing going on and a lot of things to curse, or I can look at that and I can say, no, 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 there, there's something, there's some praise in here. There's something I can, I can be thankful for. Now, Paul, why is, he, why is he asking us to focus on these things? Why is he doing this? Because he knows that a positive perspective in every situation upgrades that situation. Paul is not saying deny reality. In that verse, what did he say? He said, there's some wrong things, bad things, things that you could curse. He's not denying that they're there. He, he's, they're right in front of you. He's not acting as if they're not possible. They are possible. They're reality. But he's saying what we get to do is what we think on. Wow. I love that. So I'm going to give you a challenge. In fact, this morning, 
Remember I said I've been thinking quite a bit from yesterday? This morning, I I put this in my notes. I'm going to challenge you. This is one of the most important parts of of my teaching day. I'm going to challenge you to be one of the few that take a bad experience and turn it into a better experience. Now, now how are we going to do that? So write down that challenge. Okay, uh, you know, John challenges me to take a bad experience and turn it into a better experience. Okay, you got that? Now, now I'm going to tell I'm going to get real practical with you here for the next three minutes. How do I do that? How do you do that? How do we take something bad and make it better? We have to be intentional. What I'm going to give you can't be accidental. It has to be intentional. I have to be intentional in six things right now. I have to be intentional, first of all, in my personal time. I I have a more personal time than I've ever had before because I've had a whole bunch of stuff cancel in my life. So what am I going to do in the time that I have? And I hope the answer is not watch TV. I don't mean that's unkind. TV's fine. But I hope we're going to upgrade ourselves just a little bit. For, for example, for me, on my desk, if you went into my home right now, on my desk on the left side, right here on my desk are six books. Six books that I have purposely, intentionally picked out and said, okay, in this downtime, I'm going to read these books. Now, I haven't been able to get to them until now, but I can. And so I'm going to read those books. I'm also going to make it a time of exercise. I'm going to make it a time of, of trying to get a little bit better and healthy and eat a little bit better in that whole process. Okay, well, that's just, I, that's personal. But what the question is, is what are you going to do with your personal time? You've got to be intentional. I challenge you to be intentional in your personal time to do something that will make you better. Number two, your family time. What are you going to do in your family time? I mean, you're having more family time than ever before. Margaret and I have kind of developed a list of movies that we kind of want to see at home perhaps together. And, 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 and you know, we're going to take more walks than we've taken before. In other words, what, what, are, you going to, what are you going to do with your family that, that's just going to be uh, positive? Maybe, hey, maybe with your family you would want to sit down and share what I'm teaching. Wow, wouldn't that be good? Sit and gather them around and say, look, this is, this is how we need to be thinking. Here's how we need to be acting during a crisis time. Okay, how about catch-up time? The, the, how about your catch-up time? That, that's the third area. And, and when I, I mean, I'm not talking about ketchup that you put on, a, on f- with fries. I'm talking about C-A-T-H. You know, I, I, got, I can catch up on some things that, that I, that I would have never gotten to. And, you know, things like, I mean, mundane things like I, I, a commitment I've made is to clean my closet out. That closets need to be cleaned out for three years. Every time I go into it, it just looks at me and says, clean me out, clean me out. And I've ignored it, but i got a little time. I'm, I'm going to do that. But I'm also, I'm going to have some time now to really give to a new book that I'm writing, that, that I'm very excited that's going to come out soon. And so I, I, now I can really focus on that book. Okay, how about, oh, here's a good one for you. Number four, be intentional in your adding value time. Okay. In a crisis, people need encouragement and added value more than any other time. So why don't you every day write down one name of a person that you need to encourage, a call that you need to make, that, you know, just a touch that say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add value to these people today. Get intentional. You, you'll be surprised, not only how it will help the people, but how it will help you. Number five, okay, I'm a person of faith. You don't have to listen to this, but I have what I call my faith time. Well, what am I going to do as a person of faith? Well, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to develop my trust muscle. I'm going to really work on that. And a trust muscle basically means I'm going to have to trust God to give me uh, strength and peace when I don't have all the answers. And, and uh, <laughs> by the way, if you're not a person of faith, you go ahead and do that. You'll find out how he'll help you too. He's no respecter of persons. He loves you every bit as much as he loves me. But I'm going to work on my trust muscles. I'm going, to, I'm going to work on my gratitude now because gratitude is most hard to express during difficult times. And, and, I'm, going to, and I'm going to work on my prayer life. In fact, I, I, spent, I spent time in prayer for you today, okay? Just, just asking God to give you strength during this time. And then, okay, the, the, the sixth thing I want you to work on is your thinking time. Your thinking time. And I want you to put yourself through a positive grit. This morning, I wrote three questions I want you to consider every day as you think. Question number one, how will this crisis make me better? It's a great question. 
Give yourself 10 minutes, 15 minutes every day and say, okay, I'm going to write these questions down. I'm, I'm going to think upon this. How will this crisis make me better? There are answers. If you think about it, you'll find them. Number two, how will I use this crisis to help other people? Wow, that's huge. And, and by the way, you're going to get an abundance of answers in that because everybody needs help in a crisis. And number three, what action will I take? Oh my, this is great. What action will I take that will improve my situation? What, what action am I going to take that will just, I, what can I do that will just make me better? What advice would you give to your younger self about crisis and adversity? Let's say you were 20 <laughs> years younger, maybe oh, like yeah. me, John. <laughs> what oh, I what advice it. would you give me? I mean, your I've, younger I've self. Got, I've got a great smart aleck answer for that. Because <laughs> what advice would I give to my younger self? <clears throat> I would I would give my younger self the advice of listening to the older self. <laughs> I, I would just say, "Hey, young John, listen to old John. He's he's been through a few battles and through wars. It's a it's a, it's a great question. It, des it deserves better than a kind of flippant, funny answer. <laughs> and, and the fact here's here's what I do believe though. I I, I when when I was a young leader, I wish I would have. Um, I wish I would have spent more time with people that were more experienced and successful. I I, I, I did good, but I didn't do great. Yeah. I could let's just put this way, I could have done a lot better, Mark. Um, and it's not it's not I'm not putting a premium on old age or even experience because you know there's some fantastic things that youth bring you as far as energy and risk and and, and things. So so it it it's not like experienced people have it over inexperienced people, but they have, <sighs> for sure, if they're successful. Now, I'm talking about only successful people. I'm not talking about old people and not talking about people who worked all their life. I'm talking about people who've worked all their life and they're successful. Here's what, here, here's what I know. Here's what I know. The questions you have for someone older that's experienced and successful, they've experienced the question you're gonna ask. Oh. Now that's huge. There's yeah. one thing for me to know how to answer your question, and there's another thing for me to have experienced your question. Wow. And, and, and the difference is, if I've experienced your question, I can give you wisdom. Especially if I was teachable and successful. If I answer your question without the experience, I can just give you a good answer. But what you're really needing during a crisis is wisdom not just a good answer. In fact, mm -hmm. I tell young people, you already have a good answer, you just don't have wisdom going with it. Yeah. So you, you're a little unarmed. You know what is right, but you don't know why it's right, how it's right, when it's right. It's, it's, the, it's the experience that gives you that, that outer coating that makes you really solid. You know what I love about that answer, John, is just a, just a few days ago I asked John, a question, something about how to deal with something in the crisis. Do we make a decision now? Do we wait? Mm -hmm. And uh, John, you said, uh, you very rarely do you say this to me and, and hear me all the way out here. You said, man, Mark, I don't know. I've never led in this kind of a time. But then very quickly, so I, it gave me comfort. You know what? I'm leading in unprecedented times and, and my sure. mentor, 20 years my senior, doesn't know either. I mean, he, he experiences that, I don't know, but then very quickly went, but let me tell you what we did when 9-11 hit. Let me tell you when my ISS company, a stewardship company that John had that's raised $4 billion for nonprofits, let me tell you what we did during that time. Yeah. So asking somebody, uh, and let me get the name again, uh, Kamiko, asking somebody or getting somebody that has more experience, that has done something is very good. They may not have led here or they may not have led exactly in your situation, but they can give you experience based on another time that reminds a lesson in how you walk through it. That's very insightful and it's very good, Mark. And I would just say this. When I give Mark my mentoring or my experienced answers, uh, I, I then let him make that decision. Mm. I think I think the trouble that we older people get into is when people ask for advice, we want to control. And, and I, I, I've never had you come and say, John, could you control my life for me? Hmm. You've asked for advice. There's a difference. Yeah. And, and advice means I give you my best thoughts, my best shots, my best wisdom, 
But then you've got to go make that decision. Yeah. Because how are you going to get the experience if you don't go make that decision on your own? So I think that there's, I think as an older person, a, a, a mentor or whatever, I, I have to always remember what my place is. My place is to give you everything I can give you, the very best that I can give you. But at the end of that, then bless you and say, you know, now it's a, it's 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 your you become a better leader by making the decision. You don't become a better leader by me controlling you. Yeah, and and I think for a lot of us young leaders, if you'll allow me to call myself young, I don't think I qualify for that anymore. But oh, just in for my the moment, eyes, you qualify. Thank you, John. Trust thank me. you. Trust thank me. you. Say more. Say you look more. Look awfully young <laughs> to me. But for uh, those of too us, young, <laughs> those of us that are really working hard to lead, and I, and I've had some brand new opportunities to lead in January, only six weeks later to be hit with the coronavirus that's becoming the corona financial virus as well. And and I'll tell you this, this is what I've told you, John, and, the, and I want to encourage some of you that are leading and, and wanting to lead, <coughs> lead through this, lead through this. The moral authority of the previous generation came when they led through difficult times that they had never led before. And John, I I want six months a year, I don't know how long this is going to be, but I want six months a year for you to go, wow, Mark's a great leader, I picked him, I like him. Man, he gained moral authority yeah, in this way. Yeah, that's and what that's my gain. commitment to you. Well, you're going to do that. that. That's going to happen to you. And you can't get moral authority in a classroom. You don't get moral authority through knowledge. You don't get moral authority through uh, position or title. You get moral authority by taking people through a leadership crisis successfully. And, and you're, you're, you're going to get that. But what I think I want the listeners to hear right now is that um, that you and I— uh, have high odds of losing millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay, you you just you just need to hear that. Okay, and yet we're still thinking of the people first. We're still keeping our values. We're still thinking clearly. We still have a real sense of peace. Um, and we don't know the outcome. And I think that's powerful. That's where you get yeah. moral authority. Yep. On, the, on the back end, everybody can brag and lie. But, but, but in the middle, there's no bragging and lying here. Um, you know, this, exactly thing could, right. this, this thing could put you under. This thing could you put me, you know, who knows where, who knows where it's all going to go. But, but can I tell you something? There's, a, there's an expression that Alan Malawi taught me, who was that great leader at Ford Motor Company when he turned that around. And that when things would go that, you know, he didn't always like or, or just challenges he had to make. I loved his expression when he when he'd just always say, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yep. It's okay. And all he was saying is, I'll figure it out. There's, there's always an answer. Don't have it now, but it's okay. And what I want you to see about this is that when you have that sense of, uh, uh, sense that there is an answer and you have that sense of, uh, of, of confidence within yourself, what that means is it really works in the bad times. See, don't miss this. That's right. Don't miss this. Everybody's secure when everything's going their way and confident when everything. But, but we're, we're telling you right now, I'm, I, I feel secure. I feel confident. Uh, I, feel, I feel confident I'm going to lose some money, but I, I feel confident. That there's still an answer, and there's a there's a there's a way there's a way that we're going to find the answer. It's yeah. okay. It's okay. I, I would like to talk to you on on the wilderness experience, and I would like to use the life of Jesus as our pattern and our model to follow on how do we respond to a very difficult time. In fact, when I think of the wilderness experience, I really think of it as this is the place the wilderness experience I'm talking about. This is the place that prepares leaders to lead. I think it did Jesus, and if it worked for him, I think it'll work for us. So let me ask a question. Let me give you some answers. What what, what happens to leaders in their wilderness season? What happens happens to us as leaders during COVID-19, racial tension? I mean, what happens to us? Well, Going now into the Word and going into the life of Jesus, there are some answers to that question, and let me give them to you. Number one, wilderness experiences can be times for growth. In Luke chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, it says, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan 
and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, what I want you to do is pick up this phrase that Jesus just left the Jordan, because Jesus just had a, a, a spiritual high in his life. He was just baptized. But the baptism itself, the high came from the fact that that the Father spoke, not only to Jesus, but the people that witnessed his baptism. And there are only two times that the voice of God becomes audible in the life of Jesus for others to hear, and that's at the Mount of Transfiguration, and that's right here at baptism. And, and Jesus was on a high because he not only heard the voice of his Father, and others did also, but he heard what every child needs to hear from their Father. Three things. Jesus said, this is my son. Jesus also said, he's chosen and he's marked by my love, and he's the delight of my life. In those words, Jesus heard three things. I belong. This is my son. I am loved, chosen, and delighted by my love. And I am special, the delight of my life. Jesus leaves this incredible high and goes to an unbelievable low. He leaves the Jordan, and he goes immediately to the wilderness. Now, when we go to the wilderness, when we go through COVID-19, what's amazing about difficult days is that's where we extract our greatest lessons. Let me give you an example. For 40 years, I have had a practice of having every month what I call a learning lunch. A learning lunch is just this simple. I take somebody to lunch that's bigger, better, faster, smarter than me. I don't even eat. I just ask seven questions. I want to learn from them. And while they eat, they teach me. I ask questions. I take notes. I learn. I've done it for 40 years. Life changing. Still, every month, I have a learning lunch. One of the questions I ask in my learning lunch is for them to share with me the greatest lesson they've ever learned in life. That's always a very insightful time and very helpful to me to hear what their lessons are. And since I've been asking this question for 40 years and, and literally hundreds of times to hundreds of different individuals, there's only one thing in common about the lessons that they've learned in life that were the most important ones. Only one thing in common. And here's it, here it is. When they lean into that table at lunch and say, John, this is the most important lesson I've ever learned in my life. I know that they're going to talk about a difficult time in their life. They're going to talk about confusion, anxiety, difficulty, darkness, questions, uncertainty. Every time the greatest lesson comes out of the wilderness experience. I've seen it and heard it hundreds of times. And what I'm sharing with you is that this difficult time that we're all going through has the potential, the potential to be the greatest learning, growing experience of our life. In fact, three to four years from now, it's going to be interesting to ask people, what did you do during COVID-19 and what did you learn from COVID-19? I promise you, if you have the right attitude and spirit, the wilderness experience becomes a learning experience. The second thing I want you to know about Jesus and the wilderness experiences is that the wilderness experiences that we have in our life, they'll test, uh, they'll test your identity and they'll, they'll test your values. And, and, and note in Jesus' identity and his values, uh, who you are and what you believe, they were immediately attacked. And when were they immediately attacked? Right after the Jordan, when God himself verbally audibly identified who Jesus was and how much he was loved. In other words, he came off this, uh, I know who I am, to immediately going into the wilderness and being tested about who he was. For example, Jesus was hungry. So what was he done? Satan tempted him to turn a stone into a loaf of bread. In other words, basically he was being tested on who's going to be your source. Now that you're hungry, are you going to rely on your heavenly Father to be your source? Or, you know, Satan says, "Here, I, I can, I can take care of that need right now." 
You know, Jesus was shown the kingdoms of the earth and he was encouraged to worship Satan. And he said, hey, you do this, you get them all, you get everything. In other words, he was now being tested on who owns the world? Who, who, who's in control of this world? Now, this is huge because Jesus, again, his identity, who he was, it was, it was being tested. Here's what I know. During the wilderness experience, our values are tested. Uh, Mark Cole, who oversees the John Maxwell Enterprise, we have seven companies. And uh, with COVID-19 coming, you know, we were like other companies, you know, can we make it? You know, I, and, and Mark and I had this incredible conversation. He said, John, how, how do I lead now? I said, well, you lead with the same values today that you led before COVID. Those same values, the values never change. You see, in one of our coaching, one of our enterprises, a coaching company, we're the largest coaching company in the world. We have 30, what, I think 37,000 coaches in 170 countries. And when we, when we talk about John Maxwell team DNA, the first statement we teach them is we are people of value who value people and who add value to people. I'm a person of value. I value you and I add value to you. And I said, Mark, during COVID-19, guess what? We are people of value. We value people, and we add value to them. The values don't change. You see, I'm 73. When I was 23, I had all kinds of certainties in my life. You should have seen me at 23. I was awesome. You asked me a question, I had an answer for you. I was so certain. But over those 50 years... I have a lot less certainties at 73 than I had at 23, a lot less. But let me talk to you about the certainties I still have. You see, I have less certainties today than I had 50 years ago, but the certainties, the few that I have remaining, I'm more certain about those certainties at 73 than I was at 23 because those certainties have been tested. And one of those certainties is that I value people, and that people are valuable. If you look at Jesus in the Gospels, I promise you, I promise you, as you follow him through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the one thing you extract from Jesus' life is how he valued people, period, in the story. So the wilderness journey, it's a time where our values are going to be tested, and when we come through those Test. You see, here's what's incredible. A, a, a faith that has not been tested can't be trusted. But the moment that faith is has been tested and it comes out victorious, now, oh, you, you're, you're not talking about something that you think or believe. You're talking about something you know because that faith has now been tested. Now you can trust it. Number three. Wilderness experiences tempt us to take shortcuts. They just do. Wow. And, 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 and what did Satan do? He said, look, you, you don't have to go through this incredible process and die on a cross. Let me just tell you, you know, just bow before me now. I'm going to give you some kingdoms. You know, let's take the stone, cast it. He, 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 shortcut, shortcut, shortcut. In other words, what he was basically doing is he was saying, you know, during this difficult time, uh, take the quick, easy way out. I, I mean, in a in a day where we really don't appreciate um, the process, where we're looking for instant answers and quick fixes, are you kidding me? You see, it's that wilderness experience that you know. It, it's just basically saying you're on the operating table now, and don't don't get up too early. Let the work. He done. Well, wilderness experiences, number four, they're, they're just a part of a leader's life. They really are, because the scripture says that after Christ went through the three temptations that the devil gave him and he came out on a positive end, it said that completed the testing, testing and the devil retreated. I listen, catch this word temporarily, lying in wait for another opportunity. In other words, he's coming back to test you again. It's not like, wow, I, I passed this test. It's over. I used to think that in success that you kind of you kind of like pay you the price. So once you finish paying the price, now you go reap all the benefits. And I didn't realize that 
You never stop paying the price. You know, the dream is free, but the journey isn't. Never has been. Still isn't. Still paying the price. It's it's an endless toll road, okay? And and that's the true with your testings and my testings. It's not like, wow, okay, I got through my testing. Now it's it's not going to be difficult. No, no, it's it's going to be difficult. Remember this, everything, everything worthwhile is uphill. Everything. Your life, my life, everything. It's all uphill. Number five, wilderness experiences increase our influence with others. When we've come through those wilderness experiences and we have succeeded, our influence grows with people. Look what it says in the scriptures. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Yeah. He came back powerful in the Spirit of the Father. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Lesson number six, wilderness experiences clarify your purpose. They clarify my purpose. There's something beautiful about the, the, the wear and the and the the tear of the wilderness experience or something there's something beautiful about the fact that it it sifts us until it cleans out all the dross and and, and all the stuff in our life and, and all of a sudden our, our, our purpose begins to be clear because immediately out of the wilderness Jesus started teaching and in Luke chapter 4 verses 18 and 19 he starts speaking and listen to him God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. He sent me to announce pardon to the prisoners and recover to the sight of the blind, to set the burden and the battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. Wow. You see, he passed passed the wilderness experience, and because he did that, he came out really clear about what was his purpose in life. You see, Uncertain times with a mission provide clarity. What I'm telling leaders right now is this is a beautiful time for leadership. Trust me, it really is. And one of the things tough times, difficult times like COVID-19 does for us is it separates in leadership the players from the pretenders. It just does. It's very easy to talk about what you would do in tough times, but when the tough times come, we're going to find out if your walk matches your talk. And what a lot of leaders are finding is that there are people that they never considered maybe great leadership material, and all of a sudden they're just stepping right up. And now they say, wow, there's a player there. Didn't even know I had one. And they're finding others that have leadership positions, and all of a sudden they're, hey, instead of stepping up, they're backing up. So tough times kind of help clarify the purpose and the mission and who the players are from the pretenders. I think the last point that I want to make about wilderness experiences as we're going through this time in our life is that they call us to live a life of of significance. You see, one thing that Jesus was very clear when he came out of his wilderness experience was that he was no longer his own. In fact, in his words, he said, this is God's year to act. You see, there's a difference between success and significance. Success is about receiving and significance is about giving. And Jesus realized coming out of baptism and in the wilderness, his high and his low, that he would serve now up to his death and resurrection. He realized that his life would not be his own, it would be lived for others. When Gene shared with me the the vision that you have for Eastside Christian Church, it, by 2025, you want to expand your campuses and your people. You want to go for, I think, a 19,000 to 21,000. He had some pretty, pretty big goals for you. But when he shared that with me, I, I thought, wow, for that to happen, he needs people just like you to surround him and enter into the arena of action with him with an incredible, uh, generous spirit. You see, a generous spirit is a result of understanding that we are not our own. To whomsoever much is given, much will be required. God will only give to you what he knows will flow through you. There comes a time in our life when when we realize and embrace significance that we realize that that, re- that, that requires a generous spirit. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19 is my generosity verse. Let me just read it to you. 
Tell those rich in this world's wealth, I love this phrase, to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God, who piles up all of the riches that we could ever manage. Now, what are we to do? To do good, be rich in helping others, and to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they'll build a treasury that will last. Love that verse. Try to live that verse. So, I'm asked to give all the time. Several years ago, I sat down with Margaret, and we wrote down four questions to ask when asked to give. I just give them to you quickly. Trust me, we took us a long time to come up with the four questions, so I'm giving it to you quickly and simply, but it wasn't that quick or simple to us in the beginning. Question number one is the leadership question. When we're asked to give, we've got to ask the leadership question. The leadership question is, does the leadership have competence and credibility? Big question. So when I'm asked to give it an organization, I just have to, first of all, look at leadership because everything rises and falls in leadership. And by the way, do they have competence and do they have credibility? And you can't, you know, like say, well, they've got credibility, but they don't have competence. No, no, they, you have to have both. You, you have to be the right, real leader, live that quality of life, but you also have to be able to produce. The second question is the involvement question, which just simply ask, okay, can I give more than dollars? Question number three is the difference question. Is this organization making a difference for others, and is it making a difference for me? And you can't substitute either. either. It, you want it for, to make a, a difference for other people, but you also want to be able to look at it and say, you know what? It makes a difference for me, too. Here's what I say. The bigger the difference, the bigger the dollars. And so I look and I see those who have been very successful in their stewardship of the responsibility they've been given. And the more successful they are, the more that I want to, I want to put my dollars there and my time there and my ideas there. In other words, I I want to back a winner. I want to be part of a winner. And then the last question, and that's the God question, then simply has, has God nudged me to give? Because there are just times in my life, in your life where God says, hey, I'm nudging you. I want you to give. Those four questions are just, I think, pretty big questions. I I close with this quick story. I was, a few years ago back, I was speaking for Microsoft, and uh, for years I I mentored the COO of Microsoft, and they had me coming in for a leadership day, and I was speaking to all the presidents. Uh, If you're president of Microsoft, that means you're the leader of Microsoft in a different country. And so they had, I don't know, I would guess that day, 110 presidents of different countries of Microsoft. And I taught leadership during the day, and we were at the last session. We were doing a little Q&A, wrapping it up. And uh, so one of of them raised their hand and said, John, what, what are your financial goals? And immediately I knew that, you know, my answer wasn't going to, well, it was just going to disappoint them. And, and so I told him, I said, well, I, I only have one, but if I give it to you, it's going to be disappointing, and, and I, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm not here to disappoint you. And, and, of course, now they really want to know because I've told them I was going to disappoint them, and so, you know, they're getting kind of antsy. He said, no, no, what is it? I said, well, the only financial goal I have is, that, is I want to give all of the money that I have away uh, before I die. In fact, my my uh, my theme is do your giving while you're living, so you're knowing where it's going. And you can imagine that the, the response that had. And I mean, we got into a lively, lively discussion. And I just shared with him very simply that that I just wanted to not only make my uh, generosity count, but I wanted to be around so I could make sure that it counted. And I didn't want to leave that up to someone else someday after I was gone. And uh, by the way, that's a that's a principle that we truly live on. Every year, every year, 
I, I, I um, every year, I, I don't ask God to increase my, my standard of living, but I do every year ask God to increase my standard of giving. And every year I bump it up, uh, consciously, intentionally bump it up. And I've just found it to be an incredibly exciting journey. The only problem with that kind of a principle on money is the fact that my, my, my children are a little concerned because they said, Dad, what happens if you run out of money before you die? And I said, well, I'll just stay with you. You know, I took care of you in the early years. You can take care of me in the later years. But I give you that principle because uh, I just want you to know that um, I've met I've met a lot of people um, that were successful, but they weren't happy. Okay, they had a lot of stuff. But but I've never met a person that went into the area of significance. Remember, success is about me, what I have, what I've made, house I live in, my possessions. It's about me. Significance is about others. And I've met a lot of uh, unhappy, successful pe people, but I've never met, I've never met an unhappy, significant person. Talk a little bit about, from a leader's perspective, the power of preparing it to ask questions when the opportunities arise. Well, and Chris, let, let me say this. You were very kind to me when you said Mark and I have been around John. And so we've learned the value of asking questions. And, and I think that's true for you, but you included me in that because I, I got to be... I got to be very transparent with our podcast listeners. I still struggle to ask questions because I know the answer. In fact, when John was saying, young leaders don't know how to ask questions because they think they have to have all the answers. I'm going, yes, I'm young. Yes, I'm young. I'm a young leader because I've got to be honest with you. And I think some of it, Chris, is funny. I think some of it is, is our nature, our personality. Yes. I, I have a personality that wants to speak and then think about what I said. You have a personality that wants to think and then speak about what you thought. That's right. Right. And uh, it, it's two very different approaches. Uh, most days, I wish I had a little bit more of you in me because shoe leather does not taste well. And I <laughs> constantly got my foot in my mouth because I speak and then think about what I said. And, and I think part of my nature causes me to want to have that answer. It does give me great encouragement to see growth, though, back to this question that you asked me of preparation. Chris, every single day walking into every single meeting, especially right now where I'm leading from, I have to remind myself, speak last as a leader and listen first. Speak last, listen first. Well, that comes to, that comes to this point of the value of asking questions because yeah. You can listen better when you're in a posture of questioning than you can when you're in a posture of listening. So the first thing I would say about preparation is not some list, some thing that uh, I would tell you you need to do to prepare great questions. The first thing that I would do in preparation is say, leader, prepare yourself to listen before you lead. Ask questions before you give answers. And for me, that helps when I walk into a meeting to where I kind of know where I want it to go. And I go, why do we have an hour when I could get this done in five minutes? I mean, that's that's the leader in me. And uh, I work hard in the area of preparation to remind myself that question asking is a better posture most of the time than answer giving. And that's a big, big, big thing that I have to work on often. Yeah. And, and let me just build off of that, because I think what you're saying there aligns with our mission and our passion for life, which is not only does John say that we're going to learn something, which I love that learning posture, right? We we'll always want to be growing, always be learning. But leaders, um, especially in a one-on-one -on -one situation, and Mark, you, you know, I'm not just saying this to say this. I, I believe in one-on-ones. You're one of the best I've seen in this because you do ask questions. Matter of fact, sometimes uh, it makes me uncomfortable uh, how many questions you're asking, right? But listen, here's my point. Not only are you learning my perspective, but also as leaders, as we ask questions of those that we have influence with, 
and they're answering and they're speaking to us, they feel valued. Okay. Don't miss that. Like, so there's a, there's a double-edged um, value here for us as leaders. Number one, not only are we learning and we're in the posture of learning, but number two, our people are feeling valued because we're asking them questions and they're allowing that, allowing to speak in that. Now, one other thing I want to comment on, because I don't, I don't want leaders to miss this. Mark and I do have different personalities and we approach meetings and we approach questions differently. What Mark just told you is a learned behavior as his personality is he does have to slow down sometimes. He, he does want to come into a meeting and be like, here's the problem. Okay. Here's how we're going to fix it. Does anybody have any questions, right? Any comments? Well, he's not going to get anything, but what he's learned in this learned behavior is to ask, um, to listen, you know, listen first, ask questions later. Here's what I want to do I, in, in our coaching. A lot of times when we have leaders that are working through this, we say, Hey, just write some initials at the top of your paper when you walk in there. So put, like Mark said, put LF, listen first, maybe put a question mark, then ask questions, then speak last. Whatever you need to do, Mark has a system now, whatever you need to do to implement that system in order to be able to do that so that you can learn as a leader and that your people feel valued. So let's dive in because I, I, I do want to give some really practical um, application and how you live this out from a leadership perspective. So uh, Mark and I chatted just a minute before we started and I said, hey, I know you're working on this with John. There's a bunch of them here. Give me two or three, and let's talk about some practical application, and that's what we're going to do. So the first one that I just want to hear from you and share with our listeners is the opportunities are not seized in ideal situations. And, and I think some of the greatest opportunities I've seen you and John walk through were definitely not ideal situations. But how are you growing in the mindset to understand these situations we're in right now? They're not ideal but there are going to be opportunities in them. Talk to me about the conversations you've had, maybe examples, just share from your heart on what you're learning in regards to that from an opportunity standpoint. You know, um, I think the biggest thing for me in opportunities, and especially in this opportunities not in the ideal situation, is leaders can never turn it off. And I know we're supposed to, and I know we should, and I know we need rest, and I got all that. But some of the greatest opportunities, as John taught in this lesson, comes when? In times of problems, mm. right? A problem presents itself, and then boom, boom, we have an opportunity. Well, one of our problems is, Chris, you know this, our bandwidth here at the Maxwell Leadership is, is stretched. Now, we have 22% more HR personnel, human resources, we have 22% more this year than we did last year. And that was after another 20% from the year before. Mm -hmm. We have grown significantly in the past little bit. Here's why. I'm building the platform. I'm building the foundation where we can have bandwidth to pursue more opportunities. John teaches, and this is a little bit of teaching, and I'm going to get That's into good. application, That's but good. John teaches test, fail, learn, improve, re-enter, right? We've talked about that multiple times. We hear that all the time here in our, in our community. But for us to have a test, fail, learn, improve, re-enter mindset going from founder to foundation, one of the things that I've found that we have to do is we have to increase the bandwidth. We have to increase our 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 ability to pursue opportunities because John has a nose for opportunity. Number one, he's gifted. Mm -hmm. Number two, he has wisdom of many, many years of being able to ascertain pretty quickly. Is that a good opportunity? Is it not? Well, I'm a new leader. I'm a new guy to having to sense and seize opportunity. I've just been the guy executing on yesterday's That's opportunities. Right, right. Well, yeah. now I've got to sense and seize them. Well, guess what's going to have to happen for this 52-year-old guy? I'm going to have to test, fail, yeah. learn, improve, and re-enter. I'm going to have to try a lot of things to determine if some things work. Now, will I have to try everything 10 years from now that I'm having to try now? No. But right now, I'm having to try a lot. So leaders, here's my first practical point. If you're new at sensing and seizing opportunity, build bandwidth within your team that gives your, t your organization elasticity to test things yeah. that are not going to work out. That's right. Your fail ratio will be less in the first part of sensing and seizing opportunity. Yeah. You will get better. And I think for me that one is it doesn't speak to me. If I try a bad opportunity, it speaks to my immaturity. 
It doesn't speak to me that I, it was a failure. It speaks to me that it was a lesson learned. And I think for what I would tell you at the very beginning of opportunities are not ideal situations. You've got to change the perspective and say failure is okay. Yeah. Trying too many things is okay. And our ability to learn from them is the desired outcome, not a successful opportunity. Yeah. You know what I want today? I want to know something didn't work as much as I want to know something That's did right. work. That's right. That mindset is absolutely imperative if you're going to learn how to sense and seize opportunity. And what underlines all of what you just talked about is one of our values and John's so passionate about, which is growth, right? Like, I mean, that, that, is a, that is a personal growth journey. That's one of many that you're on. But as leaders, as we go through those opportunities, if we're okay and we're open to that and testing and failing, we're going to be learning. And every day we should be learning, just like we're sensing for new opportunities. Now, one of the things I want to transition you in, because this is something we've struggled with when it comes to focus on certain opportunities there, there, is a, there is a time, and I know um, both you and I have sought counsel and wisdom from John's brother, Larry, and he says one of the things leaders don't do is get out fast enough, right? right? And so there are going to be opportunities that we have the privilege of walking down the road that will multiply our business, our top-line revenue, our, uh, our, our reach, wh whatever your KPIs are. There are opportunities that are going to multiply that for you. But then there are opportunities that are just going to disappear, Mm -hmm. And and I think you have to have not only from the leader perspective, but the team and the capacity that you talked about that's working on. You guys have to be okay with saying, where did it go? Right? Like, don't go try to dig it back up if it is disappearing. If you walk through that door and there was a reason to do that and the opportunity was there, it's either going to multiply or disappear. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about that in regards to what you're seeing uh, go, running this lap with John and where you're at around opportunities. Well, so... Recently, um, a few weeks now ago, we all got to watch the Masters yeah. of Golf. And uh, for those of you that don't watch it, I'm sorry, you miss one of the greatest televised sporting events that there is. Um, but And you've played sports at every level. And, and in sports, you realize that there are opportunities that come, and you miss them. And you know what sports, uh, the greatest of athletes do when they realize they missed it? They learn from it, but they move on. And I've watched too many business people that when the opportunity disappeared, they try to go recreate the opportunity and they spend more time on resurrecting an opp yesterday's opportunity than looking for tomorrow's opportunity. Yeah. And what sport, what we can learn from sports right here, Chris, is an opportunity will disappear. You missed it. Okay, get over it. Let's go. Let's keep moving. Rather than going and trying to resurrect it. I've also seen... It, to to the point of your your question here, to where you sense an opportunity and it begins to multiply and begins to produce greater results than you can even handle. I think learning to triage is a word, or learning to prioritize is another word on opportunities that begin to multiply yeah. is very important. Let me explain. Several years ago, we were launching a new initiative for one of John's for one of our nonprofit. And we, as we launched this, the opportunities began to explode. In other words, you've heard us talk about it. We went from two presidents of companies inviting us to countries, rather, two presidents of countries mm -hmm. inviting us to come in to 22. You know what John wanted to do? Say yes to every one of them. <laughs> Say yes to what, what was the statement that he made? Uh, opportun um, oh, opportunities takes now for an answer. Yeah, yeah. Not no for an answer, yeah. out now for an answer. And, um, <laughs> and we begin to accept bad partners mm. in the sake of sensing and seizing opportunity. And, and I know John is teaching this from a great perspective of, hey, sometimes they multiply, sometimes they disappear. Right, right. Be okay with either okay one. With Keep it. moving. Right. But at the same time, I think we also need to understand that when we miss an opportunity, we need to learn from it so that we don't miss it again. Mm -hmm. But we do need to move. That's right. And the second thing is, is sometimes there's too much opportunity, and we need to learn how to prioritize that so that the multiplication of that opportunity doesn't become distraction to what's working within the organization. That's good. That's good. Uh, listeners and viewers, I hope you caught that right there, because we can sit here at this, at this podcast, and as we're sharing and, on video and, and you're listening to audio, we, we've been distracted before. We have. 
we've made some mistakes where we've lacked focus. Matter of fact, you've taken us through some exercises where we went back over a five or a seven, 10 year period. And we said, where was the greatest impact and influence that we've had? And we looked and it was where we were keeping focus on certain That's things. Right. And so don't miss that point as we talk about opportunities. Well, as we wrap up, there's one other one, as we, we talked about in this season of growth that you're in from a leadership with John. And this is the nourishing, the opportunities. They're, they're going to be there. Uh, they're going to multiply. They're going to grow. Daily, we're going to be looking at it. But we, we have to intentionally, there's another one of our favorite words around here, intentionally nourish these opportunities to even give them a shot. Yeah. Um, talk about some things you put in place. And I'm sitting here smiling while I tell you that because even you working with me and giving me some additional responsibility outside of my day job, uh, yeah. which we all have day jobs around here, and then we have the job, <laughs> the right? Other the, jobs. the other jobs that we have around here. But you got to nourish them, right? Yeah. They, they are given to you for an opportunity. You were aware, you were keen about You got to you got to nourish them and know if they're going to bear it's any fruit. It's funny that your mind went the same place because yeah. we did not. I saw the look in your eye, yes, like almost didn't. like you had something else you wanted to <laughs> yes. share with me too. In fact, right now I brought you here to tell you about another <laughs> yeah, opportunity I need to work on. That's right. Um, what, what's interesting is, is as you were saying that I did, I went right back to um, what you did, and you know we're we're in a window. And most organizations and most leaders do feel like it's a window. It's now or never. It's it's fight right now. Let's go. Um, we're in this window of going from founder to foundation. We're, we're in this window of taking our one pen that we've been writing with for many, many years, John Maxwell's pen, and we're placing the Maxwell leadership pen into multiple thought leaders' hands. And um, we're, we're merging. We're acquiring organizations. And I believe that in, in, in merging and acquiring organiz, organizations and sensing the opportunity like we're talking about and seizing the opportunity, there are some non-negotiables. Yeah. One is, is culture. Culture has got to be protected. It's yeah. got to be fought for because there's been two. The statistics are not with us in no. mergers and acquisitions, right. okay? Don't That's go right. look at the statistics because it'll scare you from ever merging and acquiring anything. That's right. However, there are success rates. There are success factors, and I think one of those is culture. So going back to you, Chris, um, we've, we've, we've got a window here to where our, all, our opportunities need to be nourished. So what are we feeding our, our opportunities? Mm. We're feeding them culture. We're feeding them foundational principles. You've been in John's world. You, you took a sabbatical. We all yeah. laughed about that. Yeah. But you started John's world before I did. You, you get this in a way that very few people do. So when I am acquiring are merging, are sensing an opportunity, in this case, bringing organizations, teams together. You know who I rely on to nourish that opportunity? The person, the people that know what the opportunity should look like when it is culminated into our organization. It's Godi. The other day, I we, we had a leadership meeting, and I was talking about the worst-case scenarios with a particular opportunity that we're going. And I say, I'm prepared for the worst-case opportunity. Because if the worst worst case scenario, if the worst case scenario happened, you know what I'd do? Chris Cody would change his office. He's going to start coming in in another part of town because I got to have him there. And you kind of laugh because we've said we're willing yeah. to do whatever. Yeah. And maybe that was the first time you heard it positioned like that. But we already know we're going to nourish these opportunities yeah. that we have by feeding the nutrients and the things that's needed for that opportunity to ever have yeah, a chance. Yeah. And what I love about what you're doing and even just what you said is this, as you nourish these opportunities for maybe your business, maybe you have a selfless lens on why you're looking at it. The awesome thing about what we're doing is we're nourishing the souls, if you don't mind, of those that are inside those organizations. Yep. We're adding value to people. Again, coming back to another core principle of ours and a value. We're adding value to people that then they can even multiply. You talk about bringing additional yeah. pens. I was on a, a call this morning, Chad Johnson and I, with one of our thought leaders. And, and we were like, hey, let's, what else can we help you with? What can we take off your plate? How can we get you to the point to where, and having those conversations nourishes not only a bigger opportunity for our enterprise to be able to to get a message out there to people that we have a passion about, but also it nourishes those individuals and adds value to those people. So those were just three uh, that we wanted to kind of share and pull out. Again, there is nobody better and, and nobody, nobody better, better than Jen, John that sees his opportunities and, and, and works them and has taught you to be able to do that. We wanted to give you some application to be able to do that. Closing thoughts for our audience. Yeah. 
One is, it, it goes back to Sun Tzu's uh, quote that says, victory comes from finding opportunities mm. and problems. And in my case, and all I can bring to you, podcast family, is where I am and how I'm leading. The biggest thing that I have in sensing and seizing opportunities is not letting how I used to view environments affect the opportunity that is laden in that environment. That's good. And I, we were at a golf tournament recently with some very well-known, recognizable names to you, and um, we went to the golf tournament in the guise of supporting a new friend, a new partner. What we found was more opportunity than we knew what to do with mm. it. What we discovered was partners that did not even know that there was something we could partner on. And I can tell you that that golf tournament that was could have been just a golf tournament, went and had fun in a very, very nice course. But we had a little bit more intention. We wanted to support a friend. It could have stopped at the golf. It could have stopped at supporting a friend. But what happened by the end of the night, Chris, was a realization that opportunities are more prevalent than we're aware of. Mm. They're more readily a, a available for the picking, if you will, than we even realize. You, you wrote this chapter called Create Your Opportunity. Mm -hmm. And most people, they think of most uh, the notion of opportunity actually as something you find mm -hmm. rather than you create. So talk to us a little bit about this concept in the book. Well, uh there's also a pretty good story in there. And of course, Don's, a, I mean, really, if you like stories, you the, really got to read this book. Yeah. I'm not that great of a storyteller, it, it, but you I couldn't tell it. very good here. <laughs> you uh, could tell but it. I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty good when you're talking to me, yeah. but I couldn't do it the way Don helped me do it. He was just so inspirational in that. And so there's a sports metaphor in there in this, in this particular chapter, because we talk about Eddie Malone and myself. Mm -hmm. Well, Eddie Malone was our star running back in high school. I mean, he was the prototype six foot two, you know, really fast guy. And we're running this drill where it'd be like at this table right here. Well, I'm coming up this line. He's up that line. And whoever meets in the middle, that's who you're going to go against. One-on-one, -on -one, yep. no blockers in between. Yep. And I'm thinking, I'm like 160 pounds. He's like 220 pounds and just a rock. And I'm thinking, I, I could die today, right? <laughs> yes. I literally could die today at age 16. <laughs> but uh, I said, okay, you got to create your own opportunity. I mean, I wasn't thinking that, but I said, I'm going to do my very best right here because I didn't like not not uh, not being a starter. Yeah, as a sophomore, I didn't start. Okay, right. but I got in some games, but I wasn't a starter. So we went at it head to head, and I won. Now, he may not have been going full speed thinking, I'm going to run over him. He's not going to be that big. But I will tell you, what the what happened then is the coach picked me up by the back of my jersey, which they used to be able to do. You probably can't do that <laughs> <Yeah>. these days. <laughs> and he said, this is my starting middle linebacker right here. Wow. And the confidence, Mark, I will tell you, the confidence that that put in me at that time has led me through life. Yeah. And that sounds small. I mean, because we were a small school, you know. We yeah. wasn't anything special about us. But the confidence. And so that just tells you, too, that how we affect others, but taking that opportunity, right? And then taking the opportunity in business of saying, you know, I want, I, my name's not Murphy. I worked at Murphy Oil yeah. in El Dorado. Yeah. And I, so I knew there was a glass ceiling. And so I wanted to be able to create my own. So that's why we moved to Dallas and looked for other opportunities. And then, you know, eventually set out on our own. I just finished a mentoring call with a very good leader. I, I, I meet with him on the phone for an hour about every three months. And he's very successful. He is a top leader. And so we were having a conversation today, and he was talking about 18 months of leading people through COVID and very, very difficult times. And, and he, was, he was talking about the fact that he had just, um, his, his business just expanded, uh, I think, almost unrealistically for what he's gone through. But he said something interesting. He said, John, he said, we're really growing and things are going well. But he said, I'll have to admit emotionally, I'm, I'm a little bit hard on myself right now. I'm not as happy as I thought I would be. He said, I, I just, am I, as I'm looking at this, I, I should be happier. I should be more excited. And I said, I'm happy. I'm excited. But he said, I, I just don't have the degree that I kind of thought I would have at this point. And he said, can you help me walk through that? And so I, I called him by name and and I said, I shared with him, I said, I, I think I understand where you are. And I said, where you are is this. For 18 months, you have been leading people uphill. 
you, you all, you know, you've all heard me talk about everything worthwhile is uphill, so I don't need to talk about that anymore. But but the only difference between average leadership, which is always uphill, and and COVID leadership, is that it's just a steeper hill. And I said to him, I said, you have been leading for 18 months uphill, bringing people along, encouraging, lifting, doing everything you could to help everybody finish the race, be successful, do better in their business, do better in their own personal life, family life. I said, you've been pulling people, pushing people, encouraging people, lifting people. And I said, I think what, I think what the challenge is, is you emotionally are just low on fuel. I said, what you know mentally and what you feel emotionally aren't the same. What you know mentally is this is a great accomplishment, what you're doing. But what you feel emotionally doesn't match that. And I said, it's going to, it's going to take some time for you to refuel and, 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 and build up your emotional tank again. And I want you to know that. And, and he was so grateful. We had a pretty good conversation about that. He said, John, I, you just, I think you just helped me. Well, I, I'm coming from that mentoring conversation to our mentoring time together. And and really, Aaron is the one who put this lesson before me and really developed a lot of it for me. And so we had some time together and we talked it through and we built the lesson for you. And I thought, how um, appropriate timing-wise to come out of one mentoring session of a very successful leader who just is emotionally a little bit tired and isn't maybe celebrating to the level that he thinks that he should, and, and now me talking to you. And why, why am I talking to you about an abundance mindset? Because I think over the last 18 months, the prominent emotion in most people's life has been fear. And, and, and so as a leader, you're having to lead people through this wilderness of uncertainty and fear and what's going to happen and what's happening to me. A lot of questions. And I think you uh, have, have been pulling well, leading well, doing very well. I mean, look at look at Monet and look at look at how well you've done as a company this year. But but I think you've had to work harder. You've had to work harder to get where you are. Booker T. Washington said, success is not where you have arrived. He said, success is what you had to go through to get where you are. And, and it's the going through to get where you are that sometimes just kind of wears us out a little bit. I was doing a, I was doing a lesson the other day for another company, and it was entitled "How to Overcome Hard Times." And my opening statement to them is what I wanted to share with you right now. I said, "If you want to overcome hard times, you have to go through hard times. Don't miss this. There's no such thing as vicariously leading others." how to go through difficult times without going through them yourself. How do you develop leaders? They have to practice. They have to practice leadership. How do you how do you lead during the hard times? Well, you have to go through those hard times yourself. So as leaders, you've kind of you've gone through them, but now you're trying to bring your people through them at the same time. And what I want to do is I want to really focus now, remember what we focus on expands. So for these next few minutes, focus with me on abundance. If you and I are walking down a street and we're just breathing, okay, we're just walking, talking, we're breathing. Not one time do you look at me and say, John, do you think there's enough air to breathe? Not one time do I look at you and say, wow, we, you know, measure your breaths because, you know, gosh, we could, we could run out of air. No, no, no. It never enters our mind because we have grown up in an environment of abundance, that there's plenty of air for all. All of us. But let's just say, for example, we're scuba diving. And in the scuba diving, all of a sudden, maybe one of the tanks malfunctions. And instead of having two tanks, we got to have one tank to get back up to the surface. And now all of a sudden, we're being very careful and we are measuring our breaths and we are asking each other, do we have enough air in that tank? Now, what I've just described is a scarcity mindset. And let me just say this. During adversity, it's okay for a brief time to go into scarcity. And the reason it's okay is because just as the scuba diving illustration is, 
we understand we got a problem. We only have one tank of air. We've got to get back to the service. So now we have to measure our breath. Now we are asking the question, is there enough air? And, and what I want you to know is during difficulties, during uh, surprises, there's a tendency for us all to say, oh, what do I have? How much do I have? Again, the best way I can illustrate that is that, you know, when COVID hit, probably the first two months, Mark and I continually discussed the issue of how do we make payroll and, and how do we keep people on board and, 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 and how, what, what adjustments do we have to make? And Mark, as a good leader, began cutting and, and pulling back. And we, we did that so we could take care of our people because our people were first. But, but, I mean, he had to make all kind of adjustments, and, and, and he, he literally operated with a, there may not be uh, enough money to go around. There may, be, there, there, may be, there may be issues we don't know about. And he took a scarcity mindset. Now, here's what I want you to catch. It's okay to have a scarcity mindset in an emergency. It's not okay when the emergency is over to stay in that type of thinking. That's what I don't want you to miss. And so many times, I think, we allow what happened behind us or the, the experiences that we've had to begin to cause us to lead differently instead of leading abundantly. Again, we go back to the illustration I've given you before. Am I a river or am I a reservoir? A reservoir has a scarcity mindset. Hold the water. You may need it for, a hey, a not a rainy day. And the river is just flowing and, and, and giving and, 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 and depositing water wherever it can or wherever it should. So we want to focus in this lesson purely on abundance. Now, Stephen Covey is the person who really, I think, gave us the breakthrough on abundance in his seven habits of, of effective people. And if you'll let me, I'm going, I'm going to read just a couple paragraphs in the book because I don't know if you've read it. By the way, if you haven't read The Seven Habits, I want to say that that is a book you ought to read without any question. That That is a classic book on leadership and even more a classic book on success in life. And uh, Stephen Covey was a terrific uh, friend of mine and a terrific leader, and he tragically died a few years ago. But... Um, in fact, he wrote the inter, uh, the uh, foreword on my book, uh, uh, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. So if you, it, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, if you don't have the book, you need to get the book. I'm going to read a paragraph. In fact, when I read this couple paragraphs, you'll say, oh, I, I need to go get this book. Here's what, here's what Stephen said. Most people are deeply scripted in what I call a scarcity mentality. They see life as having only so much as though they were only that there were only one pie out there. And if somebody were to get a piece of that pie, it would mean less for somebody else. The scarcity mentality is a zero-sum paradigm of life. People with scarcity mentality have a very difficult time sharing recognition and credit, power, or profit, even with those who help in the production. They also have a hard time being genuinely happy for the success of other people. Then Stephen Covey says, now let me contrast that to the abundance mentality. The abundance mentality flows out of a deep inner sense of personal worth and security. It is the paradigm that there is plenty out there and enough to spare for everybody. It results in the sharing of prestige, recognition, profits, and decision-making. It opens possibilities, options, alternatives, and creativity. Now, Stephen did a great job just giving us the scarcity mindset and the abundance mindset. I think probably you already had that, but I wanted to read from that classic book and, again, encourage you, if you don't have it, to, to purchase it. So let me now break it down for you. There are three very simple statements. They all kind of just go together. Just let me give them to you. Then we're going to build off of them. We're going to do some teaching. The first statement is that I see what I'm prepared to see. I don't see everything, and you don't see everything either. We don't see what is. We see what we're prepared to see. That's why two people can be in the same meeting and see two different, totally different things. That's why a person can even go into a room and see, I mean, 
<sighs> my gosh, I, w- 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 I remember one time Margaret was at a conference with me, and, and so we were having lunch after the morning session, and, and, and she said, you know, John, when the guy came up to you with, with, the, with the blue coat, well, you were in a conversation with him for a while. What, what did he ask? And, and I said, Margaret, I don't remember somebody talking to me in a blue coat. Oh, no, no. I mean, he was with you. You probably were there together for four or five minutes. He had a blue coat on, and he was like a foot away from you. I mean, you're talking. The guy in the blue coat, I'm just curious, what what, what, what was the conversation about? Well, Margaret, I don't remember seeing a guy in a blue coat. Now, was a guy in a blue coat in front of me? Of course. He's three feet away from me. Did I see the blue coat? No. Why? Margaret is into colors and decoration. She's an artist. She can tell you what everybody is wearing and what colors they all have. I can tell you none of that. I I I don't that that isn't even where I am. I'm I'm watching facial expressions and I'm 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 watching the the lean in. I'm I'm watching posture and everything. So now here's what what I want you to understand is that this is huge. I see what I'm prepared to see. Now this is important because if I'm prepared to see scarcity, I will constantly see that there's not enough. If I'm prepared to see abundance, I will constantly see that there's more enough. Now, let me give you the second statement. The second statement is, what I see becomes reality to me. It's real. And so when somebody comes up to me and they have a scarcity mindset and they say, you know what, I, you know, I just... Wow, I think we're kind of, I don't think we're going to be able to make it. I look at them and I say, I, I think you're probably right. You, you won't be able to make it. Someone else comes up and they may be in the Monet and they say, my gosh, I think this is the, the sky is the limit. Yeah, I think you're right. The sky's, you see, we not only see what we're prepared to see, but whatever we see, it becomes reality to us. So when a person lives in a scarcity mindset, what they're saying isn't wrong. I, I watch people trying to correct them all the time. No, no, no. What they see is what they see. It's reality to them. Just as a person in an abundance mindset, what they see, that's a reality too. Which brings me to the third statement. And the third statement is how I view things determines how I do things. So all of my behavior comes out of how I see things. That's why this abundance mindset is absolutely huge. Stephen Covey, in his book, basically what he says is very simple. He said, in a world of scarcity, you constantly miss opportunity, even when abundance is all around you. What's he saying? You're not lacking opportunity because opportunity is not there. You're lacking opportunity because you're not seeing opportunity. You have a scarcity mindset. You see, scarcity equals the negative, which equals, which equals what I would call fearful emotions, where abundance equals belief or faith, which is positive emotions. So we both have it. I have, I have within me, you have within you a scarcity emotion, and you have also an abundance emotion. You've got them both in you. There's no such thing as you are void of one. I have both belief and I have both fear. Okay? That's not the question. The question is, which of the two is the stronger? Because the stronger emotion always wins. Not sometimes wins, not usually wins. The stronger emotion always wins. So if my scarcity fear emotion is greater than my belief abundance emotion, then to be honest with you, I I will recognize that some people are abundant, but I'll go right back into the fear pattern. And the reverse is also true. The stronger emotion Always, not sometimes, the stronger emotion always wins. So, how do we control that? We control our emotions by our emotions. The next time you're really trying to figure this out, just take the word emotion and strike the letter E. Motions create emotions. Motions determine emotions. What have you upgraded during the, the difficult time, the, the, the high climb? What, what is it that you've gotten better at? What, what have you improved to make up the difference for that which perhaps you lost? Sometimes people come to me and they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, John, don't go ah. 
boy, I, I, there was an opportunity and I, it, 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 I missed it. I, you know, it was kind of like in front of me and before I could make the decision, it was gone. And, 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 and I, and, and I lost that opportunity. And I always look at him and say, no, no, you didn't. Don't, don't worry. You didn't lose it. Somebody found it. Who finds the opportunity? The abundance person. Scarcity people never find an opportunity. But the abundance person, they've just been waiting for it. And when you pass it on because you think that there's little or less, they're going to say and say, oh, my gosh, there, <laughs> there's much more. It, it's a mindset. So choose to see the opportunity. An abundance person says there's an opportunity there. The third thing that I want you to do is remind yourself that there is more than enough. And I would say not only remind yourself, you know, Covey talked about the pie, remember? And he said, if there's only one piece of pie and somebody takes a piece out, or if there's only one pie, somebody takes a piece out of it, you're saying, wow, there's only five pieces left. You know what Stephen Covey would say? Go bake more pies. And by the way, while you're baking more pies, bake a pumpkin pie. How about a cherry pie? How about a berry pie? How about an apple pie? In other words, not only bake more pies, but get more variety in the pies in that whole process. Let me just say this. The greatest solver of problems, the greatest solvers of, of, of adversity, difficulty, pettiness, the greatest solver of pettiness is growth. When people start growing, secondary things truly become secondary things. So I want you not only to repeat after me that there's plenty for everyone, but I want you to begin saying that not only to yourself, but I want you to begin saying that to your team. And, and say it often enough that you not only say it, but that you, you live it and you, you believe it and you, and you act it out and you, you behave it, okay? You got that. Let me give you the fourth. Remember, motion creates emotion. Number four, carefully select the company that you keep. Now, this one's really personal, okay? Because let me tell you something. Mindsets are contagious, and so if you have a lot of scarcity people around you, can I tell you something? After a while, it'll wear you down and you'll start to think scarcity. Just like if you have a bunch of abundance people around you, it'll lift you up and you'll begin to see more and, and, and begin to do more. Mindsets are contagious and you've got to limit your time. You have to limit your time with scarcity people. Or, or maybe maybe this will maybe this will connect with you. You've got to limit the Karens in your life, okay? Now, I had no idea what that meant, but Aaron told me that if I said that, you would know what that meant. So, do you know what that means? Do you? Do you? Do you okay, you all know. Okay, good, good, good. It worked. It worked. Because Aaron said, "Tell him." Tell, Tell them to eliminate the Karens in their life, and they'll just understand it immediately. And I said, well, you're going to have to—who's Karen? Who's Karen? You're going to have to talk to me about Karen. And then she told me, the Karen, I said, oh, yeah, I want to eliminate the Karens and the Carls in my life. If it's a Karen or Carl, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, if, it, if it's around Karen or Carl, if it's even close to that name, I'm eliminating him, okay? I'm just saying, no, no, you got a negative mindset. So that one's for Aaron. She said, oh, if you'll just tell them to eliminate the Karens, they'll, 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 they'll get it. Now— Okay, I'm a little old and outdated, but that's all right. Here's what I want you to hear. I know this journey. I've lived this journey. And I've had a lot of success in my life, and I'm going to tell you one of the reasons. I began to eliminate very early in my life the Karens and the Carls. I understood very quickly that there were people I could not afford to spend time with that they were going to pull me down, they were going to drag me, they were, they were, they were going to limit me. And, and I would say probably the biggest decision I made as a young leader was to pick my friends very carefully and pick my team. Now, as a leader, let me just say this. As a leader, you got Karens in your group, okay? We all have Karens in our group. We have Carls in our group. And, and you love them unconditionally. And, 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 and the verse for you, for them, when, when they come around you too much is, is, is that, that is, this too shall pass. Okay, this too shall pass. But, but li listen to me very carefully with, with the Karens and the Carls. As a leader, you have them in your group, but you have to be very careful not to spend an inordinate amount of time with them. 
because they'll want it. They, they, you know, we used to call them when I was a pastor, EGRs, extra grace required, because it took extra grace. You just, oh my gosh, here they come again. And what I'm saying to you is you have to understand very quickly that you need to spend the time again with those people that are going to be able to give you that return. And, and, and I began to drop very quickly hundreds. Yeah, you heard that right. Hundreds of scarcity people in my life. I could not afford to let them have influence into my life. I had to make a hard decision. Number five, um, to, to have an abundance mentality and mindset, spend time in reflection. And, and and let me just let me let me just pull out reflection for a moment. I I, I think I should have said spend time in grateful reflection. As Oprah Winfrey said, you need to have a gratitude journal. And you need to continually be uh, writing down the things that you are grateful for. Now, because you know them, because they're on my inner circle team, both Mark and Aaron, one of the things that just stands out with both of them, major stands out with both of them, is how grateful they are. There is never a time that I'm with them never a time, that sometime in our time, they express gratitude to me. I mean, in fact, embarrassing. Sometimes I just, okay, I got it. I got it. You're grateful. You're thankful. Now, now can we get back to work? But it, but it, but it, but it, but it comes right from their heart. And let me just say this. This is absolutely huge in having an abundance mindset. I have never met a person with great gratitude that had a scarcity mindset. Gratitude is synonymous to abundance. Don't miss this. Grateful people are abundant people. Just as entitlement is a scarcity mindset. And so I want you just to constantly have an attitude of gratitude. When our grandchildren were small, this is a long time ago. I'm talking about, let's see, John's now in college. He would have been about five years old. So this would have been, good Lord, it had been 12, 13 years ago. We, 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 the kids were little. They were from, from about three to about 10. And during Thanksgiving, we decided to do a Thanksgiving play. And we got costumes for the kids. And on Thanksgiving Day, we dressed them all up. And we, I gave them lines. I was kind of like the producer of this play. And, 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 and John, who is, 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 is pretty much a techie and, and not strong with words, he had one thing to say when it came his part. And that was, I have an attitude of gratitude. And, and I'll never forget, I, if I went over that one line with him once, I went over that line with him a hundred times. And he'd, he'd try it and... It, and finally looked at me, he said, Papa, he said, it's just hard to have an attitude of gratitude. And, and I said, you know what? You're really right. And he was saying, it's hard to say it, but it, it was kind of, it was wearing him down. I'm just going to tell you right now that when you reflect with a, with a thankful spirit, it will always keep you on the abundant side. In his book, Steve Marabelli wrote a book called Life, the Truth, and Being Free. He's a coach and he's a speaker. He said, those with a grateful mindset tend to see the message. Don't, oh, don't miss this. I love that. Those with a grateful mindset tend to see the message in the mess. And even though life may knock them down, the grateful find reasons, if only small ones, to get back up. The last thing I'm going to say to you, because, oh, my gosh, time's running away from me. I'm going to, we're going to get, do some Q&A here in, in a moment. Um, but but the, number six, let me give you the last motion to do, and, and that is give more of what you want. Now, this sounds very counterintuitive when I say this, but one of the greatest ways to increase your abundance is to be generous. And, and you know, it, it was, again, Zig Ziglar that helped me as a young leader. He said, if you'll help other people get what they want, they'll help you get what you want. That's what he was talking about right there. And by the way, you know I'm a person of faith. What did Jesus say? I'm I'm going to read one verse of what he said. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount that you get back. 
In other words, be a river, not a reservoir. Have an abundance mindset. And the more that you share, give, generously, open up to others. I'm uh, Margaret and I bought a house a, a few months ago, and so we're down in Florida because my they put the shelves in my office, and so I came back down to put my books and get my office in order. And my office is looking great. In fact, Mark, I'll I'll, I'll have to take a picture and send it to you. I mean, it's really looking good. Okay, I mean, it's really looking good. And so, but there's, you know, we're trying to put things in the office that were in the previous office, and and you know, some things fit, some things don't fit. That's just the way it works. But I had some of these great John Wesley uh, Staffordshire antiques. There, I mean, one of them today it was it was made in eighteen or no, yeah, eighteen ten. So it's two hundred and twenty one years old. And, and I don't have a place for all of them in this new office. The, the configuration's different. And so I've got me a, a, a shelf up at the top, and it's and and I I called told Mark that I called it my generosity shelf. And I put a whole bunch of things that probably don't fit in my office that I just love, really love, and they're just very important to me. I, I put that up there. And I said, I'm just going to keep them there. And when somebody comes to see me that's important to me or they mean a lot to me, I'm just going to reach up there and pull something down and, and, and give it to them. Now, I, I want you to know that that mindset, that mindset that I have is going to cause me problems. Because as I share and am generous and give it away, I'm going to get more in return. And then I'm going to have a real problem. I'm going to have a storage problem before it's all over. I close with this quote that will do Q&A. William James said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their life by altering the attitudes of their mind. He's right. And you and I, can change our mindset the moment we want to. So let's just determine throughout the rest of this year, we are going to think, live, and be part of the abundance mindset. I wanna to talk to you about having the courage to continue. Again, these monthly mentoring sessions that we do together are just uh, to help you every month, every 30 days to to learn something new and then apply it to your life and apply it to your team for the next 30 days until I come and be with you again. You know, often I'm asked the question, especially during difficult times like we are in today with a lot of adversity, um, how do I continue? One of the questions I was asked when COVID hit, I mean, for the first six months, everybody asked the question, how long will this last? How long will this last? And it's the wrong question to ask. If you and I want to continue and really have courage in the midst of all kind of difficulties in our life, the answer is very simple. We need to focus on today. Today matters. And if you and I focus on today, trust me, my friend, we will have enough courage for 24 hours. I don't know if I have a courage for a week. I'm not sure I have courage for a month. Wow, I'm Maybe I don't have courage for the next year, but I'm not asking for that. I'm saying that if you want to continue in your life to be successful, you have to have a focus on today. You know, courage, I describe it in a picture, like courage is like a door, okay? And, and what's interesting about this door is the handle is on the inside. It's not on the outside. And the only way that door is going to be opened is for you to walk over and for you to turn that handle. There's nobody on the outside that can open the door of courage for you. There's, there's nobody on the outside that can do something for you that'll make you courageous. It's a personal act that you just basically say, you know, I'm going to go over to that door. I'm the only one that can turn that handle. I'm the only one that can open up the door of courage, and I'm going to do it. It's, it's a choice. It's a commitment. So let's talk about that commitment for a moment. I want you to know, first of all, um, courage is not an absence of fear or failure. So when we think of courage, don't think of a person that just has no fear. Oh, my, my gosh, they, they just have no fear. Look what they do. Or my, the failure, failure doesn't seem to bother them at all. They seem to be able to overcome their failures. 
I, I just want you to know the courageous people experience failure in their life. Courageous people have fears in their life. But but the difference is, remember the door, the door's on the the handle's on the inside. And, and they understand something about their fear, and they understand something about their their failures. They understand something about their faith and their belief. And what what they understand is, is that they have to build up the stronger emotion by focusing on it. Because what you focus on expands. And so what they do is they focus on courage instead of focusing on fear. If I focus on courage every day, and if I live every day to be courageous just for that day, one day at a time, guess what happens? Every day I, I, I increase my courage. Just like if I, instead of focusing and going to that handle of that door that has courage, that what happens if I go over and turn on that, that handle that has fear in my life? If, if every day I get more fearful, all I do is I increase by focusing on a negative emotion until it expands in my life, until the fear dominates the failure. Whichever emotion dominates, the positive faith, belief, the negative fear, failure, Whichever dominates, that's where the, the action, our actions follow the dominant emotion. And what's powerful about this is it doesn't have to be 90% belief and 10% fear. It could maybe be 60-40. You could have quite a bit of fear in your life and still be very courageous because you've got 60% belief that allows you to go ahead and try it even though you're not sure. So you want to always build up the, the stronger positive emotion. Another, another thought on courage is the fact that, that courage requires action. You have never become courageous by thinking about it. You and I never become courageous by hoping for it or dreaming about it. We only become cra- courageous when we take action. There is no success without action. I'm always amazed at the people who try to think their way into success. They, 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 they try to kind of maybe wait on success. You, you have to take action. When I was a young leader, I had a mentor that just gave me an exercise that was life-changing to me because he said, John, you don't take enough action. And so he said, I want you to, for 30 days, when you wake up in the morning before you get out of, the, out of your bed, say out loud to yourself 50 times, Do it now, 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 do it now. He said 50 times, say it out loud every morning, then get out of bed. He said every night before you, you know, lay your head on that pillow 50 times. Again, say out loud, do it now, do it now, do it now, do it now. He said, I want you to do that for a month, 50 times every day, every morning, 50 times every evening. And I did. I mean, I just went home and I, every morning, do it now, every night, do it now. You know, two days, three days, one week, two weeks, three weeks. And, and what I want you to know is by the time, by the time I got into the into 30 days, every morning when I'd wake up, my first thought was action. Act on it. Do it now. Do it now. And, and I want to encourage you. I, I began to saying things. I mean, right now I'm talking to you. I promise you, there are things that you have procrastinated that you're hoping will go away and you'll never have to deal with and you're just fooling yourself. They're not going to go away. And the only way that you're ever going to knock that giant out of your life is, is by taking action. And the, 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 the last thought I want to give you about courage is that life expands with your courage. Just like, let me just say this, it shrinks with your lack of courage. Your life can get bigger and better or your life can get smaller and it, it, and it can get worse. Let, let me illustrate it by saying there's a difference between a puzzle and life. Um, if you've ever put together like a thousand-piece puzzle, you know what you do. You put the pieces on a table like this, but you got a box, don't you? And on that box is a picture. Every puzzle has a picture. The picture is the vision of what that puzzle will look like when you complete it. So here's what's interesting about the difference between a puzzle and life. With a puzzle, you get to see the clear picture before you begin. In fact, you watch that picture and you find the pieces and you put the puzzle together. But you see the picture before you begin. 
in life, it's exactly opposite. You have to begin before you can see the clear picture. And most people lack the courage because they don't understand it's the action that will provide the picture for them. That the moment that they move out, that the moment that the the closer you move to what you see, the clearer you see what you're moving toward. So don't miss it. Don't wait for the action to become clear. Don't say, well, the moment that I really figure it out, I'm going to get started. Or the moment I get my answers, boy, I'm going to begin. You know, you get the answers as you begin. You figure it out as you go. It's, it's the action that brings clarity to the picture. So courage is basically going to that door and turning that knob. No one's going to turn it for you and say, I'm going to take action. I'm going to walk out this door today. And as I start walking, I don't have all the answers, but I'll find them. As I start walking, I don't, I don't see the whole picture, but I'll see it more clearly. Trust me, that's how you get the courage to continue. You got to start to continue. Take action today on what you know you should be doing, but you haven't done it yet. And you'll be surprised how quickly the courage comes to you. Unstoppable leadership. How to lead yourself, how to lead your business during any difficult, tumultuous time. That's the question. How do you and I continually lead successfully even during COVID or times when uh, adversity begins to come our way? I've given a lot of thought and a lot of consulting with companies and teams about how to continually succeed during these difficult times, how to be unstoppable. And what I'm going to talk to you today about, I promise you, is going to help you no matter what adverse situation you face in your business. I want to talk to you on the subject, how to, how to receive a return on your failure. Now, while we, we hear an awful lot about uh, having a return on our investment and ROI, or maybe a, a return on our time. I mean, I gave it this much time. I'd like to have some kind of a return out of it. But I've discovered that people don't look for a return on their failure. In fact, they don't want to fail. They don't want to sometimes admit failure. They want to remove themselves from any kind of failure. And, and that's why, <clears throat> as I talk to you about this today, I promise you that I'm going to deliver some material to you that's going to be your best friend when difficulties and setbacks come your way. Because you see, let's start off with the fact that everybody fails. I fail. You fail. In, in fact, failure to me is quite common. It's, it's not something that happens once a year or every six months. I pretty much fail on a continual daily basis. I, I have misses. I have losses. And I bet you do too. Now, something that happens so often in our life, we need to learn how to handle it correctly. It's, it's not something that we have to handle every six months or year. Pretty much, I have to be able to understand failure, handle it correctly, and get a return on it on a daily basis. Everyone fails. No one likes it, and I will promise you that nobody loves failure. I, I've never had a person walk into my life and said, you know, probably the biggest motivation in my life has been my failures. That, <laughs> that doesn't happen. We, we, we're not motivated by our failures. Sometimes we're discouraged by our failures. And, and so what I'm going to talk to you about today, I promise you, is going to give you an amazing return on your misses and, and, and on your losses that you have as a leader. Now, as a young leader, I had a real fear of failure. I was just starting off. I wanted to prove myself, and I definitely thought that failure was my enemy, and I definitely thought that if I failed a lot, people would look at me and say, well, it's obvious to us that, that you're not a good leader. So I was mentored by a, a, a wonderful man, a terrific leader himself, Robert Schuler. 
one day when he was talking to me and we were dealing with the how I did not like failure and how I tried to avoid failure and how I had a fear of failure, Dr. Schuler said to me, John, what would you attempt to do if you knew that you wouldn't fail? Well, I had never looked at life quite like that in business, and so it kind of helped me for a while. I kind of went into every project basically saying, I, I won't fail. And, and, and so it, there was kind of a, a positivity that began with me in the beginning of the project, and I kind of went in with a, quite a bit of, 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 of strength and steam. But, but there was a problem with the question. What would you attempt if you knew that you wouldn't fail? The problem with the question, it's not true to life. There is nothing that you and I can go into with the assurance that there won't be failure in it. And so what happened is it, it made me strong on the front end, but it blindsided me when I got into the project because all of a sudden, even though I started it as if I wouldn't fail, guess what happened? Humanly, I failed. I had some misses. So I, I really learned very quickly that I couldn't, I couldn't go into life kind of like eliminating the possibility of failure, that I had to somehow not only include that possibility, but appreciate it. And not only appreciate it, but appreciate it to the level where I would learn from it. So how does that happen? So over time, I developed my own question about failure, and this is the one I want to give you, which will be the foundation, the platform of everything that we talk about today. And here's the question. What would you attempt to do if you knew that the failure would give you a positive return? In other words, when you go into a project in business, you know that there are going to be failures. But what would you do if you knew that when you had a failure, instead of it being a setback, a minus, a hurt, a negative, what would you attempt to do if you knew that that failure, when it was looked at correctly from the right perspective and respond to it correctly, what would you do if you realized that the failures that you have in your project today in your business can give you a positive return? Now, what happens is the moment and you and I have this mindset, and by the way, this is realistic. What I'm about to teach you will give you a positive return in your failure. So this is not some pie in the sky. It's not Disneyland. This will work for you. The failures you have in your project, once you understand the benefits of failure and once you begin to respond correctly to it, there are so many positive to it that I will promise you, instead of becoming embarrassed by your failure, after a while, you'll begin to embrace it. And that will make you unstoppable. You see, what stops people in their business and progress is failures, setbacks, disappointments, expectations that weren't met. That Those are the things that make what we're attempting to do, frail, feeble, until we stop. To put unstoppable in your business, to put unstoppable in your life, you have to have a healthy respect and love for what failure can do for you. Now, when I or when you, when we re anticipate a return on failure, in other words, I say, I'm in the project and I think there'll be some misses here, there'll be some losses, there'll be some failures. When that happens. If we expect a positive return on our failure, our whole um, response to failure will immediately change. It, it won't bother us to at all to fail first. We'll, we'll jump in before anyone else jumps in because we know that whenever they jump in, there's going to be some failure. So we immediately become more initiators in our projects when we have a positive return on our failure. And we'll not only fail first, we'll fail fast. It won't bother us all. In fact, we know that the more misses I can get out of my way, the quicker I can get to the where I really want to go. And we'll fail frequently. Now, if you don't have a positive return for your failure, you're still going to fail frequently also. 
But the difference is, when you know that you can get something good out of a loss, what happens is it doesn't bother you to have another loss because you know it's going to be a lesson that you learn and you know it's going to be progress that you make. Here's what's most important. When you realize you can get a positive return out of your failure, you'll fail forward. In other words, when you fall, you fall forward. You, you even make progress in your fall. And, and so much of success is not there were no problems and there were no obstacles and everything was smooth. No, so much of success is that it was a series of failing forward. And that's what, when you get a positive return out of your failure, that's what you'll do. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results 